Hi, my name is Neil Glick. I'm a virtualization architect here at NetApp, and today with me I have my co-host, Bumik Patel, who is an alliance architect with Citrix. Thanks for being here, Bumik. Yeah, glad to be here, Neil. So this is a series of video tech talks that we're going to present to you. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about uh, NetApp write optimizations for Zen Desktop, and we're also going to be showing you a demo. So Bumik, uh, can you tell me a bit about what you're seeing with Zen Desktop in the field and uh, what your customers are doing? Right. So. Uh, when we look at desktop virtualization with Zen Desktop, we are looking at uh, delivering apps and desktops using different types of uh, delivery mechanisms using our FlexCast. You might have heard the term. What that really means is we allow organizations to adapt to different user requirements and deliver them the best, uh, you know, best model for the for the different end users. So we have things, you know, VDI, uh, pretty common hosted share, which is our Zen app based uh, server based computing model. Uh, offline mode uh, used on Zen, Zen client por product portfolio, uh, you know, remote PC allowing you to leverage uh, dedicated hardware, uh, and, uh, and our stream model for on-campus deployment. So at a very high level, it's very flexible. So when we talk about what our customers are doing and, and what are the different uh, design architectures, and, and the most common one with and, and keeping NetApp uh, from a storage perspective, what we are looking at is, uh, and let's talk about VDI, right? So from VDI perspective, we are looking at how are the different, uh, you know, how are the VMs provisioned? So when you look at a base VM and, and a golden OS you have, uh, Windows 7, Windows XP, Windows 8, um, what are the different provisioning mechanisms used, right? Because that's what ultimately will define how the architecture will look like. So, so are you seeing more VDI out there? Or are you seeing more hosted shared? Right. So again, as I mentioned, uh, you know, for an organization, it's a good mix. And, and a different ways of uh, delivering their apps and desktops. So, you know, if you are a task worker uh, and you care about just uh, just getting in and getting out, doing your work, then hosted shared is a good model for you. If you if you need all the personalization and flexibility, then then VDI is what we recommend. Okay, great. Right. So, we look at different machine types here. Uh, you know, we have the common pooled desktops, which is our shared model. You know, you read only. Uh, this is non-persistent, but very cost-effective. Then we so have our. Where uh, would you normally see those kinds of desktops? Probably like in call centers and things like that. Yeah. So we see them everywhere, right? So what happens is an organization. If you look at uh, a typical enterprise organization, they'll start off with uh, with a pool desktop because that's uh, traditionally we relate VDI with the pool desktop type model. Um, and then if you are looking at more personalization and more uh, more persistency, then that's when they'll go to that dedicated. So if, if any organization, if you ask me, customers that I visit, uh, there's a mix of pool and dedicated desktops. Okay, great. Right. So the dedicated, as we, as we see, is a, is a more one-to-one -one mapping, and that's what makes it more... Uh, more cost, uh, more costlier because the infrastructure footprint is is higher. Right? Yeah, so I, I you know I've heard a lot of you know great things about your PV disk technology. Uh, it sounds like you know it really kind of bridges the gap between pooled um, and dedicated right. desktops. That's right. So it's our hybrid model. It uh, is integrated into Zen Desktop uh, through our Ringcube acquisition last year. So it gives you the best of both worlds. So you get the you get the persistency that you get with dedicated desktops at a cost of the pooled desktops. That sounds okay. great. All right. Few other models here are, you know, existing types. When when you look at a P2V, you know, customers doing a physical to virtual migrations, uh, and and continue to use their ESD tools to manage their apps and desktops, then they can use existing. Do you see a lot of P2V out there, or is it mostly brand new? Uh, we see them as a means of transitioning into a complete virtualization space. So when you start off from a physical world, uh, and and you are hesitant to go all the way uh, into VDI, this is like a, a step towards VDI. Oh, okay. Next one is physical uh, that allows you to for you know for your high end users uh, to leverage the horsepower of your underlying machines. And last but not least, and what we'll talk about today is our stream uh, solution. Um, and when you ask what what most customers are doing out there, this is what we see as a as a most uh, commonly deployed uh, solution, right? So this is through our provisioning services, mm -hmm. uh, which is part of Zen Desktop, which is our streaming solution. Uh, so what we'll do today is for our, for for a mostly NetApp audience, we'll we'll give you a quick high overview of what PVS is, but then we'll look at the architecture, uh, Zen Desktop architecture based on PVS with NetApp, and Sounds then we'll look at how NetApp can handle this storage as well. Right. So at a very high level, you see here um, you have your hypervisor which has your Windows uh, virtualized VMs. And then you have the PVS server, which could you know, which could be a physical server or a separate VM, which is going to use as a streaming solution. Right. So this is where you would virtualize your uh, OS, 
and it's going to cache it in RAM mm -hmm. and it's going to deliver it over the network. So that's the key here because when you have hundreds and thousands of desktops, they're all now going to be pixie booting over the network, which means from a design perspective, your read IOs are split over the network. Mm. So you see the storage here is now uh, reduced, uh, you know, in in terms of uh, I/O split. So you know you're mostly now concerned for your backend storage to be right I/O friendly because it's going to see more right I/O traffic, right? So uh, this is how we look at a typical architecture. So you know you look at all the different components that go in, and then this this is Zen Desktop with the, with the stream model. Uh, you know you have the V disk we call, which is the virtual disk that gets uploaded on the PVS server. Uh, you know that. Uh, could be stored locally or it could be stored on, on the back end controllers in this case. Uh, and then you have your write cache. So remember, this is a pool model. So all the reads go from the base OS, but all the writes, you know, when, when the user's doing activities, they need to uh, do a temporary write. Uh, they all go into this write cache. Uh, and then so obviously. What, what happens to that write cache when the, when the desktop's reboot? Right, so it gets flushed. It just gets right. flushed. So that's how you don't have that persistence in this pool model, right? So they get flushed. Uh, and then the users, the, the next user comes in. So that's how it doesn't matter which VM you go to. Okay. So, okay. The the few other components are obviously the user data, you know, this which is uh, stored on safe shares and stuff. So you see from this architecture, these are the different components that we care about when we are talking about designing them for from a, from a storage perspective. So maybe you can explain how a uh, NetApp controller would handle all these different types. Sure. So as you mentioned, all the, the great components that are part of PVS, um, for example, the VDisk, what, what we recommend our best practice is to put that on a SIF share. And the reason for that is that we can have multiple PVS servers right. actually sharing that one image, which really alleviates some of the pain that architects uh, and, and uh, administrators have to do if they had to have multiple VDisk images. Right. And with SMB 2.1 now supported on NetApp, uh, 8.1, I believe. That's correct. So that allows uh, PVS to cache the content in RAM, which was not the case in, in the older SMB versions. That's correct. Okay. So in previous versions of ONTAP, we recommended iSCSI, and that was the reason is because we didn't uh, support SMB 2.1. Okay, so with 8.1, SMB 2.x is fine, and that's why we recommend... Uh, Actually, a cor uh, correction, it is 8.1.1. 1.1, okay. That's correct. Good, good to know. Um, yes, it's good, it's good to know. Um, so, um, the write cache, as you said earlier, right. uh, we recommend putting that on an, on an NFS share. Right. And the reason for that is we can thin provision that. Right. So as you said, it's all transient data, so let's thin provision it. Right. So when I look at this, uh, this architecture, the write cache is the most uh, important piece that I think of from design perspective, because if you have 1,000 desktops, then you'll have 1,000 write cache, right? So, and we know this is going to be 95% write I.O going to the right cache. That's correct. Uh, that's what the name stands for. So how do you, how does NetApp would, you know, optimize the right traffic? So if you can explain that. That's a great question, Bumak. So uh, as you know, um, NetApp uh, has this uh, operating system called our Waffle file system. Um, and the way it works is, as you can see the screen, uh, random or sequential writes come yep. into in, come into the controller through the RAM. Yep. And, you know, like they, they come in in any order. But what happens is when they're actually on the box, uh, they get coalesced. Um, into stripes, and those, all this is happening inside RAM. And at optimal times, uh, all this data is actually written to disk. So if I go to the next slide here, you can actually see that as the hard drives spin up only when this is actually happening. So uh, this minimizes the amount of hard drive spin up that we have to do. So this really helps optimize uh, how, you know, right. and, so and, this, and it cuts out a lot of the performance penalty. So this coalescing is what reduces the right I.O. Can, so can you explain this waffle logic a little bit better? Absolutely. So uh, the waffle engineers realized that uh, random writes are some of the most expensive. And, you know, as we know, uh, VDI is, is a lot of random writes. Uh, so what happens is all of these writes go into memory, and that's, uh, you know, where they're coalesced and they're grouped together. Um, so from that, uh, we write to disk. I see. And so that alleviates a lot of the pain that we see. So this is basically you are extending it them to be stored in RAM and then delaying those writes to the disk. That's correct. So does that mean they are now more volatile for that extended period of time? Yeah, you're absolutely right, Boomik. So um, uh, while that uh, while those while those writes are in 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 memory being coalesced, they are definitely, it is volatile RAM, and if there was a power outage, you could actually lose those writes. 
But the nice thing is that NetApp has actually thought about that, and we have what's in the box called an NVRAM card. Okay. It's a memory backup with a backup battery. So what happens is the NVRAM, its only job is to mirror what's in RAM. Okay. So, so basically, if a power goes out with a NetApp controller, uh, because of that NVRAM card, it, you don't have to worry about any That's recovery correct. issues because it's out of the box and it's going to take care of that. Absolutely. Okay. So it's an auto, it's, it's, it happens automatically. Okay. Uh, it just If the power goes out, everything that's in RAM has already been copied to uh, NVRAM because it's mirroring it the whole time, and it gets flushed to disk. Okay, very good. So I think I, we ex we understand this a bit better now. Can we uh, look at it on the uh, NAS GUI? Sure. Yeah. So what we have here is we've got our system manager GUI, and this is you know kind of our primary GUI that uh, you control the net of controllers with. We've got a couple controllers here, and as you can see, we've already got a, a couple aggregates created. So what I'll do is I'll click edit, so you can take a look at some of the properties of this aggregate. So as you can see, we've got our aggregate name our RAID type, and it's either dual parity or RAID 4, and we've got our RAID group of 16. Okay, so so question here, and, and uh, for a long time, you know, as I've designed a lot of Zen desktop deployments, and I'm sure a lot of Citrix folks, uh, we typically recommended RAID 10, because when we look at different RAID types that are RAID, uh, you know, that are right IO friendly, RAID 10 is, is, you know, with the lowest write penalty, so, here I see we are using RAID DP, so can you explain how RAID DP compares with RAID 10? Absolutely. So it, it, there is some confusion behind NetApp and, and the different RAID uh, levels that other storage vendors do. And NetApp does things a little bit differently. We, since we built the Waffle uh, OS from the ground up, uh, the RAID array is actually more there just for data backup. It's okay. not really there for... Uh, you know, for write or read penalties or for I optimizations. See. It's there primarily to just, you know, make sure the data is protected. Okay, so on surface it looks like it's a RAID 6, but because of the waffle logic and the, the coalescing that you explained, it does not incur the write penalty of a RAID 6. You got it. Okay, all right, that's good to know. I'm pretty sure uh, I had this misconception for a long time, um, and it would be a good good understanding. You're not the only one, Boomik. I, I get that question all the time. Um, you know, definitely, you know, what are some of the RAID levels you can set the net up at? And when, when folks hear that, that, you know, really all you can do is these two levels, they think, wow, this is, this right. is good. But, but, you know, when I discuss them and tell them, you know, you know the logic behind right. the OS, they, they, they really start to understand some of the magic behind this. Okay, very good. So this is the basic aggregate you explained. That's correct. All right. And uh, this, you can use this, I, I assume, to create your... Uh NFS shares? Yeah, so what we do with our aggregates is after we create the aggregates, uh, all the magic happens at the volume level, and we call those flex vols. So if we click on our volumes, I've already created a couple volumes here, and I've given them your name. Yeah, thanks, man. Hey, anytime. So what we've got here is our Boomic SIFs and our Boomic NFS. And so these can actually be used for anything, but um, I uh, specifically uh, name them for their purpose. So the Boomic MNFS, we can use those for our write cache. We can use those um, for our personal VDisk yeah, as well. Exactly. And then the SIFs you can use for your VDisk and your user data. That's correct. Okay. Uh, you know, best practice, what we recommend is to separate out the PV disk um, just because it's good housekeeping. All right. Okay. So if I go and I take a look at uh, the NFS and I click on exports, because that's where we would do our NFS magic, uh, you can see here that uh, Boomic NFS is already there. Um, and what we do here is this is where we set all of our, per all of our permissions. You know, what machines have access to the shares, and we can make this as strict or as open as, as we want. Okay, so as we know, this is all easy to set up and, and on a single controller. Uh, can support all the different types of, uh, of, of traffic that needs for his index of architecture. Yeah, that's the, the really great thing about the NetApp controller is that it uh, not only does SIFS, NFS, it also does Fiber Channel, yep. iSCSI, all in the same box, all at the same time. And if you have a customer who wants to do mixed, they can actually do mixed uh, all in the same box. Okay, very good. Thanks, Neil. Sure. Uh, I think uh, we have a much better understanding of how right I.O. optimization is done at the Waffle level. Uh, which was the goal for today. Uh, so thanks for joining us. And uh, in the future Tech Talks, we'll do a little deep dive on any of these components. And if you have any feedback or suggestions for topic ideas, feel free to leave a comment. And until then, thank you. Thanks, Neil. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Bumik. Yeah, thanks.